to this webinar on post-op recovery following vasoliposuction. So I'm Katie and I am the Training and Education Manager at Physiquip. So some background about Physiquip for those who don't know. We are a medical technology distributor based in the UK, specialising in rehabilitation technologies, including diagnostic ultrasound, focus shockwave and lymph touch. So we are very delighted to be joined this afternoon by post-op specialist and creator of the Aftercare Academy training programme at Petra Irving. So following Petra's presentation, we will do a Q&A session, including your pre-submitted questions that you have put forward to us as well. If we do have time, we hope that we can answer some of your live questions as well. And if you would like to submit a question um, during today's session, then please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And again, we can hopefully address them towards the end. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Petra for the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. And thanks so much for joining this webinar. I hope the information in this presentation will be useful for you and to your practice. So I'm Petra Irving. I'm a certified lymphedema therapist, a scar tissue therapist and holistic lifestyle coach. I've worked with post-op patients since 2006. Um, you'll have no doubt seen the very long list of my experience and qualifications and background when you signed up. So I won't go into it here, but if you'd like any more information, then please do get in touch. So, Liposuction has been around for a long time, 100 years in fact. Charles Dujarier invented liposuction, but unfortunately it wasn't very successful. It caused gangrene and so it was basically forgotten about until 1974 when two Italian surgeons developed a blunt tunneling technique which today's liposuction is built on. Over the years there have been advances to improve the technique with Pierre Fournier introducing the use of lidocaine, developing an alternative to general anaesthesia. Jeffrey Klein introduced tumescent liposuction in the mid 80s. And in fact, surgeons will still refer to Klein tumescence, which is a specific mixture of anaesthesia and saline. This tumescent allowed liposuction to be performed using only local anesthesia while minimizing blood loss, the risk of infection and post-operative pain. Since then, further advancements bring us what we all know today as VASER. The most well-known body sculptor today is Alfredo Hoyas. Anyone who knows of him will know he's not only a surgeon, but a great sculptor and artist. In fact, I have it in good authority that he trained John Millard, who apparently pioneered Vaser High Def in North America. So how does Vaser liposuction work? Tumescent fluid is infiltrated into the tissues prior to the Vaser part of the procedure. I've been fortunate enough to have seen this in action when I worked in London Bridge Plastic Surgery. You could literally see the tissues lifting up in bubbles as the fluid is being infiltrated. It's very fascinating to see. The vaser energy vibrates the fat within the tumescence, making it easier for the fat to be removed. Peter Prendergast, who's a surgeon from Dublin, who co-wrote the book High Definition Body Sculpting with Alfredo Hoyas, uses the analogy of shaking a bunch of grapes until they fall off. Here we can see what Vaser is best known for, sculpting musculature. In the picture on the left, there has been debulking and sculpting. sculpting. The defined shadow, shadowy areas are created by the surgeon using a deeper hand pressure on those areas. And I have a, an idea that those hand pressures may contribute to one of the main issues we see in our VASER patients. So I'm sharing a video here that will show you um, VASER versus traditional liposuction. While liposuction is the number one ranked cosmetic 
a surgical procedure in the U.S., and over half a million are performed each year. Surgeons have been seeking new ways to improve the procedure for their patients. Conventional liposuction removes fatty deposits through a process called avulsion. This is a physically demanding surgical technique on both the surgeon and the patient. It uses forceful thrusting motions of the suction cannula, ripping and tearing surrounding tissues in order to break up fatty deposits. This technique causes trauma to nerves, blood vessels, and connective tissues. Consequently, the patient often experiences bleeding, bruising, and discomfort. The amount of blood and tissue found in the collection canister following the procedure is evidence of this. The vasoliposelection technique is unique, however, because it emulsifies fatty deposits and permits more effective removal while minimizing trauma to surrounding tissues. Using a medicated saline solution infused evenly with level strokes throughout the tissue to be treated. Take care to ensure even and uniform distribution of fluid layer by layer in all treatment planes. This prepares the lipid cells for disruption when the vasor liposelection high frequency ultrasonic energy is delivered, as well as expands the fatty layer for ease of access. Vasor liposelection delivers patented proprietary technology to effectively fragment and emulsify fatty deposits while leaving the tissue matrix largely intact. Vaser technology utilizes high frequency 36,000 cycles per second ultrasonic energy. Vaser probes are offered in a variety of configurations for precise, efficient contouring of delicate to fibrous fatty tissue. The aspiration phase of vasor liposuction effectively evacuates the emulsified fatty deposits with minimal disruption to the tissue matrix and consequently promotes smooth, contoured results with low to minimal pain and bruising and permits fast patient recovery. These typical results can be clearly demonstrated by comparing the contents of a collection container used in conventional liposuction versus one used in vasor liposuction. Over time, emulsified fats continue to be evacuated by the body, largely due to post-surgical drainage and tissue remodeling in the healing period. Ultimately, vasor liposuction provides excellent results for your patients without the disadvantages experienced with liposuction. Now, because of advanced vaser liposelection technology from Sound Surgical Technologies, new options are available for surgeons to offer patients that support enhanced techniques for body contouring, provide excellent predictable outcomes, permit fast recovery, minimize trauma to adjacent tissues, ensure ease of use and surgical control. Over the past couple of years, there's been a massive increase in the Brazilian butt lift and VASER is often the liposuction procedure of choice. However, despite what the theory tells us, unless VASER is performed by an extremely skilled and experienced surgeon, it isn't ideal for large areas of quote unquote cosmetic debulking. It's great for small areas, and yes, it's great for body sculpting, but often the heat produced not only from the energy from the vaser, but also the repetitive passing of the cannula in and out of the tissues increases inflammation and therefore localized scar tissue and adherence. So these are common issues that we often come across. Um, this is a big seroma 
this young 21 year old girl went to Turkey to have her um, BBL and for some reason the surgeon stitched the incisions closed so the fluid wasn't to drain wasn't able to drain out of the drain holes um, but she contacted a local plastic surgeon and he was able to aspirate it. It's really important that patients are wearing their compression with um, foam underneath to help the tissues knit together again. Lipo burn caused by a surgeon being too aggressive and scraping too close to the skin surface. And this can happen when the compression rubs on an already compromised dermis. And on the right here, we've got what um, lots of post-op patients will see, fibrosis. Common outcomes, typical lumpy, bumpy areas of fibrotic tissue and noticeable areas of adherence. The patient on the left had eight litres of fat removed. And in my opinion, that's far too much very aggressive and you can see it's a less than perfect outcome. The patient on the right had vaser liposuction followed by Renuvion, which is a skin tightening procedure. This photograph was taken 18 months ago and you can see on the um, left hand side of the picture, it's quite a sizable scar. She had a, quite a serious lipo burn. And her injuries were so traumatic that you can see her torso is out of shape. She's tilted to the left. So why is this happening? I believe there are a number of contributing factors to the formation of fibrosis. One, surgeon's techniques. How experienced is he? Is he using enough tumescence? Is he being too aggressive? Is he attempting to remove too much fat? Is he coming too superficially? And what is his head hand pressure like? Two, how the patient heals. What's their pre-op lifestyle like? Have they been eating healthily? Do they smoke? Do they drink alcohol? Are they stressed and anxious? And most importantly, are they an ideal candidate for VASER? The wound healing process is something that all post-op therapists should take into consideration when they're working with this delicate group of patients. Not only will the patient's pre-op lifestyle affect how they heal after the surgery, but I believe the length of the procedure, how aggressive it is, and the amount of fat removed affects the stages of wound healing and therefore the outcome. This is a fabulous visual of the various stages of wound healing. If you're working with post-op patients, it's the inflammatory phase you should pay most attention to. And as you can see here, the inflammatory phase can last for as long as three weeks. Phase one, hemostasis. Normally this would be immediate. If you'd cut yourself on a knife or if you'd had a fall, uh, clotting would start straight away. However, in my opinion, this phase can't properly complete until all surgery is finished and incisions are closed. And this must have a knock-on effect to the other phases of wound healing. The inflammatory phase, for me, this is the most important phase for post-op therapists. This is when you need to be most aware of how your treatments are affecting your patient's wound healing process. So when you're doing your consultation with your patients, I suggest you ask lots of questions, length of surgery, areas treated and amount of fat removed. And this will give you an idea of how long their inflammatory phase could last so you can adapt your treatments as necessary. Towards the end of this phase is when you'll start to feel changes in the tissues and when fibrosis appears. So this is a, a quick video on the inflammation. Inflammation is a local immune response to tissue injury or infection experienced as heat, redness, edema, pain, and loss of function. Immediately after injury, inflammation begins with brief vasoconstriction of the local blood vessels to reduce blood loss 
and formation of a clot to stop the bleeding. Then, stimulated by cell injury and death, local cells release vasoactive chemicals, such as prostaglandins and histamine to dilate local blood vessels, leading to increased blood flow to the area. These chemicals also cause endothelial cells in small blood vessels to contract opening spaces between them. This increased capillary permeability allows fluids and proteins to pass from the blood into the tissue. Next, during a multi-stage process called chemotaxis, circulating immune cells called neutrophils move out of the blood vessels to the site of injury and destroy pathogens and damaged cells. Chemotaxis begins when cells at the injury site release messenger molecules called chemotractants, which cause local endothelial cells and circulating neutrophils to stick together. Next, in a process called diapodesis, neutrophils squeeze through the endothelial gaps. The neutrophils migrate to the injury site by following a chemotactic gradient. Upon arrival, the neutrophils encounter bacteria, engulf them, and digest them in a process called phagocytosis. After destruction of the bacteria and removal of cellular waste, tissue repair begins when locally produced growth factors cause local fibroblasts to begin dividing rapidly and secreting large quantities of collagen to reinforce the wound. The proliferation phase comes in after inflammation has finished. There's always a certain amount of overlap in all the um, wound healing phases. Angiogenesis of lymphatics and blood vessels, collagen and ECM form. Often there's an over proliferation of these two causing scar tissue. And this is when we really start to see and feel the first signs of fibrosis. Phase four is when the scar tissue is remodeling. It's when collagen is maturing and scar tissue has established. It's now during this phase that it's safe to do slightly deeper, yet still gentle scar tissue and fibrosis techniques to encourage fibrotic scar tissue to smooth out. Um, you can do this by using myofascial type sink, melt and stretch techniques. So fibrosis, what exactly is it? In normal circumstances, it's a pathological wound healing process where connective tissue proliferates. There's an excessive accumulation of collagen and ECM, which causes scar tissue. It's basically an exaggerated wound healing process. So after vasor liposuction, as you've already seen in the pictures of the two female patients, fibrosis appears as lumpy, bumpy, adhered tissue. If you're a lymphedema therapist, you'll no doubt have come across fibrosis in your patients. However, fibrosis in lymphedema patients is not to be confused with fibrosis in post-op patients. Fibrotic tissue in lymphedema is caused by long-term lymph stasis and the process is a topic for another webinar. Fibrosis after vasor is scar tissue caused by damage to the tissues, by inflammation from the trauma to the tissues and excessive heat created by the energy produced by the vasor probe and repetitive passing of the cannula in and out of the tissues. This trauma is exacerbated by damage to lymphatics and blood vessels, meaning removal of inflammatory debris cannot be efficiently concluded. So although the same words are used, the process and outcome is slightly different. These pictures show the adhesions and areas of scar tissue after a vasor liposuction procedure. 
this um i actually th this was a video and i've taken stills um the video was taken by a surgeon who was doing a revision surgery after performing um um abdomen he was a performing abdominoplasty after a vasor procedure had been done uh, and the patient had been left with loose skin on her tummy um, you can see um, there is very little yellow fat cells in either picture, so the liposelection was successful in achieving that. However, the scarring to the tissues is very noticeable. What contributes to fibrosis? Most definitely the surgeon's skill and experience is vital and the correct selection of their patients. Excessive debulking isn't ideal because the longer the surgeon is in the tissues with the vasor probe, the more energy and therefore heat is transmitted into the tissues. Unhealthy lifestyle of the patient, poor diet with not enough protein and balanced macro and micronutrient intake, incisional drainage or milking massage, which is not common in the UK, it's, it's more common in the US. Um, that should only be done within the first 24 hours. This helps removal of remaining tumescence and inflammatory debris after surgery. And stress, cortisol plays havoc with the wound healing process. Stressed patients have increased levels of cortisol in the blood that can slow the delivery of cytokines to the site of injury, so the wound will take much longer to heal. How to limit fibrosis. MLD should start within 48 hours to support the now compromised functioning of the lymphatic system and help remove inflammatory debris. Number of sessions would be determined on the amount of fat removed, areas treated and how the patient presents at each appointment. While the patient is still in the inflammatory phase, MLD should remain light and supportive to the lymphatic system. Deeper massage may contribute towards increased inflammation and therefore more scar tissue and fibrosis. Patients should be encouraged three to six months in advance to improve their lifestyle, including increasing exercise, limiting inflammatory foods like gluten, give them some resources to help reduce stress and anxiety before their procedure. And treating a patient after vasor liposuction, liposuction. MLD from day two. Um, depending on the amount of fat removed and the areas treated, that would be either daily or every other day for the first seven to 10 days. Um, both Peter Prendergast and Alfredo Hoyas recommend therapeutic ultrasound within the first week alongside MLD. And I've just purchased a device, so I'll be able to let you know in the next couple of months what the outcomes are like. Wearing compression is absolutely non-negotiable with bespoke foam underneath. And of course, the LymphaTouch device. Anyone who knows me knows how I love this little device. It's been part of my treatment toolbox since 2016 and definitely contributes to more positive outcomes from my treatments. And most importantly, patients love it. Shockwave therapy can be used after three months if there's still fibrosis. And I also believe that pre-op MLD is advantageous in preparing the tissues for surgery. Chris Inglefield that I used to work with in London Bridge Plastic Surgery um, used the analogy of clearing storm drains of leaves before the rains came, which I think is lovely. Uh, also, reducing stress and anxiety. Um, so I have um, relaxation audios that I give to my patients and it just helps them um, relax and de-stress. So that's it. Thank you very much for joining and um, thanks for listening. And if you've any questions, I see there's some there, um, we can address them. Great, thank you so much, Petra. That was amazing. So yeah, like you said, let's get going with some questions. Um, we do have some pre-submitted questions to go through first. So let me just bring those up. 
Um, so the first couple of questions surrounding MLD, um, which you just covered in the, the last slide, but the first question is, what in your opinion is the optimum time post-surgery to commence MLD? So you mentioned two days post. Um, is that the sort of ideal time in really that you want to be seeing patients? Yeah, I mean, definitely within the first week, but, in, but ideally within the first 48 hours. Yeah. Okay, and then the next question is, what is the primary role of MLD? So I guess in that initial stage, can you just expand on really what you're trying to achieve with that MLD massage? So MLD, because there has been um, lymphatics obliterated during the liposuction, um, the MLD in the early stages, so in that inflammatory phase, is to support the functioning of the lymphatic system. Um, lymphangiogenesis takes approximately seven to 10 days, but it can take longer. So it is um, helping reduce swelling, which is a consequence of the inflammatory phase. Um, but it's also to help remove that inflammatory debris from the tissues. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, um, this is from Lisa. She asked, how long should you wait before you can massage scars? So I would tend to wait until the um, patient is in the maturing phase. So minimal three weeks. Um, it, it depends on the patient. It depends on their healing. It depends on their scarring process. So it's, you know, there, there's no dead and fast rule. Um, you need to gauge it based on your patient's recovery. Yeah. I guess, is there any surrounding contraindications around scarring that you wouldn't massage? You'd need to check, you know, let's say that wound healing process. If first. there's been wound breakdown, then you just, you know, steer clear. Steer clear until, yeah, great. Uh, next question from Kate. Um, Kate has asked, what technique do you find works best for breaking down nodules? So I'm assuming the nodules is referring to fibrosis. Um, and so that would be um, gentle myofascial type techniques. Um, it really depends on what stage the patient is, how long post-op they are, how um, uh, established that fibrotic tissue is will determine on the the what your techniques are like. So, you know, if somebody is six months post-op, for instance, you can use a much firmer, more aggressive type of treatment than somebody that is only um, four weeks um, to, to two months post-op. Yeah. So with your sort of manual treatments, so you do sort of positive pressure with massage, hands-on, and then the combination of the negative pressure with the lymph do you think that's quite a nice combination? Absolutely perfect. Yeah. The, um, yeah, so very gentle, um, sinking, melting, stretching, myofascial type um, manual techniques, and then in combination with something like the lymph touch yeah. um, is absolutely ideal. Yeah. And like you said before, it's about that sort of really like kneading and knitting sort of techniques that are really going to try and break down that sort of cross section. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and the next question is when treating post phaser patients, I often see them presenting with severe induration of the tissue. Why is that? It's fibrosis. So it's you you can get the tissues are not going to heal at the same same stage. So you know where one area has been treated will start healing quicker than you know another area. So those indurations are um, part of the healing process. Again, depending on the length of time post op um, would determine how you are treating that um, uh, tissue. Sometimes it can be um, the residual fat tissue left behind. So it's, you know, it's really, you, you need to base it on each particular patient. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and is vasoliposuction beneficial for lipedema patients? 
It's definitely the liposuction of choice for lipedema patients. Um, um, I'm not sure about the long-term outcomes. I don't think there has been a long enough study done to see what the long-term outcomes are, but I think it is definitely very successful. Um, again, if it's large areas of debulking, um, it would need to be done in stages because, as I said in the presentation, you don't want to have the vaser probe in the tissues for too long because you're then causing excessive heat um, and therefore scar tissue. So I, I think definitely is, it's successful for, for lipedema. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And then we've got a couple of questions um, surrounding seromas, uh, which seems to be quite a common question that we get through. Um, so from Carol is how to identify a seroma and how to treat it. So could you give us a bit of a brief? So a seroma is, is you, it's, it's, it's like a hot water bottle or um, like a water bed. So if you were to press on the tissues, um, you would see a rippling effect in the tissues. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite noticeable. You, you definitely feel it, you know, sort of your, your hand moving on top of the tissues. Um, treating it, I think that definitely seromas need to be aspirated. Um, I know that there is an issue when patients um, go abroad and come back and the NHS is um, reluctant to, to do it because the surgery hasn't been done in the UK, but there's always um, a private um, healthcare provider that will do aspiration. Mm -hmm. And with the seromas as well, um, I guess they can differentiate in how, how serious they are as well. So obviously you can sort of see more obvious a seroma, but sometimes I've seen previously that seromas can be very slight as well. So it can be from a therapist's point of view, a little bit tricky of, is it a seroma? Is it not? Am I safe to, you know, treat? Does it need, like I say, further treatment? So again, is it something like if you weren't sure if it was or wasn't a seroma, you, you would prefer and try and get some. Yeah, but you, I mean, you're, you're not doing your MLD is going to be beneficial anyway for, for, for the seroma that we saw in the presentation, MLD would not be beneficial to that. But it's really important that people are still wearing compression and um, foam as well to, to help the body reabsorb it. Mm -hmm. um, for the smaller seromas, mostly they will reabsorb um, and then Further down the line, you can use a slightly firmer uh, massage technique. Yeah. Okay, great. And yeah, you did um, answer as well, sort of within that, the, the next question, which was about um, patients going abroad and then, like I say, the NHS not being able to um, sort of treat. So you've clarified that. That's great. Um, and the next question is surrounding contraindications. So could you just go through some absolute contraindications from your point of view, which I like, say you would just stay away from? For, for what? So sort of prior to manual treatment. So I guess sort of just that list of contraindications, like say the wound healing and things like that. I any mean, other... anything that is, so if there's any breakdown in the wound healing, if there's any redness or increase in skin temperature, which could signify infection. Um, yes. Generally, if you're doing a really good um, consultation with your patient, you will know what, what is contraindicated. Mm -hmm. um, I have not, not treated any patient um, unless it has been a, 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 an infection. Okay, yeah. And uh, do you tend to get anyone who is uh, more on that sort of psychological sort of side where they're actually very conscious or cautious of sort of touch and manual therapy? I guess that would be sort of an indication that, let's say... There's no, if somebody has gone through cosmetic surgery, they are not shy about I, having treatment. Yeah. <laughs> the, one, the one thing that, that is, can, again, this is a subject for a, 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 another webinar perhaps, is body dysmorphia disorder. And I think it is becoming massive 
now, um, particularly with um, social media and young girls, for instance, that 21 year old, you know, going to Turkey to have surgery, she previously had breast augmentation, you know, so there, there is, we, we need to be definitely aware of the patients that we're treating that have the, that disorder. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, so the next question, we've got a couple more pre-submitted and then, yes, we'll get going with the Q&A section as well. So thank you for submitting those. Um, so, Petra, your thoughts on incisional drainage? That's the question. So incisional drainage as um, an MLD therapist, you would think, oh no, we can't do that. It's definitely not something that we would recommend. However, Alfredo Hoyas um, and Peter Prendergast, um, who lives in Dublin and I've got really quite a good relationship with, we, we had a conversation recently, and um, they really advocated um, incisional drainage within the first 24 hours to get rid of any remaining tumescence. It's not an aggressive form of um, massage, so it's, it's gently encouraging fluid out of drainage holes. It definitely should not be firm and aggressive. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's, you know, there is a place for it. Um, and then from the 48 hours, then you're doing MLD. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, the next question from Jill is, can you recommend trunk garments and stages? Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, so Jill has asked, can you recommend trunk garments? So I'm guessing some of the compression garments um, and stages. So obviously I think you mentioned it briefly, the last bit of your presentation. So the compression garments can be a bit of a minefield. Um, I use one particular company, and I'm not sure whether I should give their name here or not. Um, the, the companies are brilliant. If you um, are seeing any patients prior to them having their surgery, um, then, you, then you can recommend. Um, so I, I recommend Lipoelastic because they've got, they've got the biggest range of garments available. Um, and their customer service team are fantastic. Um, it's, it's easy for patients also to they measure themselves and they can then check on the Lipoelastic website what size garments they should be getting. Um, there, there is, you have a, um, a stage one and a stage two garment. I personally think there should be four stage garments, but then it's getting really expensive for the patients. Um, stage one garment should be um, within the first week. This is my opinion and shouldn't be so excessively tight because you want any remaining lymphatics to be able to um, function and not be too compressed. Um, and then you would move into a, a, a phase two or stage two garment. I think some of the um, companies do it the other way around, that they will start off with a firmer garment and move into a less firm garment. Um, but from, from my perspective, I think it should be the other way around. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and the next question is quite interesting from Sue. Have you seen cording after vaso, uh, vasolipo to the upper arm? Um, so she said that a client of hers presented with this recently. So I need a wee bit more information on this. Is this person um, had lymph node dissection? Have they had um, breast cancer? Mm -hmm. um, is the procedure just for um, cosmetic reasons? Um, I personally have not come across anybody that has had cording from just having um, a cosmetic liposuction procedure on their arms. Um, for me, that would be um, scar tissue from, having, from the cannula being in. Um, so it, if I had more information on that, then it's easier for me to give a, you know, a better answer. 
Yeah, no, great. We'll get uh, in touch with Sue after that and we can sort of expand on that one. Um, okay, so uh, just a few more questions. So we've got some questions surrounding um, sort of the technology devices. So one of the questions, how can Limp Touch help with post-op care? Um, and would you use Limp Touch in the treatment plan? If so, how soon into the recovery programme? Next questions. I use Limp Touch with all my patients. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's, I mean, it's, it's great. I generally would start Lymphotouch uh, in week two. I wouldn't, because we want those tissues to knit together. So it's, you know, a nice, gentle, um, supportive MLD. Um, so from week two, absolutely, I would use it um, on a lighter session. And as time progresses, then I would um, um, build up the pressure settings. Um, from week three onwards, um, depending on the patient, how they're healing, where there is being um, thickened tissue that starts appearing. Uh, again, it's I use the vibration setting, and again over time that um, uh, would would increase. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question, the difference between Hivermat and your device. So I think maybe referring to Limp Touch with that one. Um, and she just said that Hivermat is used for stubborn edema and fibrosis as well. So do you know anything about Hivermat? I don't, can't really comment because I don't know too much about the Hivermat, um, but they are two totally different devices. Um, I, I honestly, I can't comment. I don't know any yeah. comparisons or differences. Yeah. Again, let's say we can probably get some some contacts. We can definitely send some information over on that one as well. So I'm just going to address some of the questions that are coming through, or just some comments on the on the chat. Um. So. Do, 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 do. So yes, yeah, Sue Hansard, thank you for joining us, and um, has sort of less left a comment that um, she believes that there's a lack of advice and info from surgeons is, is definitely lacking. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think um, very interestingly, having had a conversation with Peter um, Prendergast, it's, you know, the surgeons think differently than therapists. You know, they they're, they do their surgery and that's what they're they're thinking about. They're not really thinking too much about the aftercare or the recovery. Um, and so as therapists, we need to know exactly what the patient is going through. Um, but yes, I think that conversations with surgeons would um, definitely improve how they are um, informing their, their patients. Yeah, great. Um, and then we've had another comment and a bit of a question. Um, so this um, lady here, I found patients that wear compression, it has caused redirection of the swelling, caused more bruising um, and ex exacerbated their fibrosis, increased their fibrosis, sorry. Have you heard of this problem? Well, that sounds to me like they're wearing ill-fitting compression. Yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, if, if the compression is fitting snugly and they're, they're wearing foam underneath, it's going to um, help reduce swelling and bruising and uh, used in conjunction with MLD, you know, you'll, you'll get rid of that swelling and bruising quite quickly. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think we've actually covered quite a few of those um, bits of questions coming through. Um, I'm not sure if I've missed any. Okay, I'm just going to quickly check the other box. Yeah, so we've got a question from uh, Vivian. So can you say more about bespoke to form under compression garments? <laughs> I'm not sure if you can expand any, any more on that one. <laughs> um, um, I could if I had a bit of foam. So I, I cut foam to fit my patients. Um, <clears throat> being, you know, a, a lymphedema therapist, you learn to use foam uh, pieces uh, when you're doing multi-layer bandaging and so I've just adapted that and um, so I would get um, a, a piece of foam and I draw a template and I cut round it 
so that it's specific to that patient um, and depending on the procedure they've had. So that's, that's, I mean, if anybody wants to ask me directly afterwards, I'm, you know, very happy to, to go through it, but it's, that's basically what it is, is I, I get big sheets of foam and I cut them to fit my patients. Great, thank you. And there's lots of positive comments coming through as well. So saying that their presentation is very informative. Um, so thank you. So I think we've um, covered all the questions there. And if we haven't got round to some of the pre-submitted questions, we'll definitely get back to you um, on those as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I really hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you, Petra, for your time and expertise. It was brilliant. So hopefully we can definitely do more of, of these next year anyway. Um, following this, you'll receive a link to the webinar recording along with a feedback survey. So we would really appreciate any feedback and suggestions for any future webinars. That would be great. Um, Petra, if you could just go along the slide for me. Um, I think we've got some details on the next slide. It's on the previous slide, actually. Oh, was it? Yeah, that's the end. <laughs> All right, no problem. <laughs> so what we'll do is, um, yeah, we've got some contact uh, details for yourself, Petra, so we can um, pass those on if anyone has any further questions. Um, also that anyone can now sign up for the next uptake of your Aftercare Academy training programme, which it looks amazing. Um, it's not a very valuable resource to further your skills in this area, I think. So let's say if anyone's interested, get in touch directly with Petra. Obviously, we can definitely forward Petra's information for that as well. Um, and as always, um, you can also register to our Physical Academy where you can find all our past webinars and other educational resources as well. Um, and again, any further questions, if you want to find out more about our products or educational events coming into the next year, then please do feel free to contact us at any time. So otherwise, thank you again, Petra. Amazing. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us and hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.